Hey, hey, it's Conrad Thompson. Thanks for checking out the podcast here on YouTube. Be sure to hit the subscribe button and the notifications bell. You'll get a notice anytime we upload some new content. And when I'm not asking Bruce, hey, how big was Batista's? Well, you know. One of the things I like to do is help people save money. And if you're watching this video right now and you're in a 30 year loan, man, you're overpaying your single biggest bill and you may not even realize it. I want you to do a little experiment for me. Take your calculator out, multiply your monthly house payment by 360 payments. That's how many payments there are on a 30 year loan. That big scary number, that's your total of payments. You're looking at that number? You know you can do better. Keep more of your own money right now and go to savewithconrad.com. Or maybe you've got credit card debt. Man, it's not a matter of if I can save you money with that. Your average interest rate on a credit card is more than 20%. And by the way, all the interest you pay on those credit cards, it's not tax deductible. Whereas the mortgage interest, well, that is tax deductible. So if you owe this debt, it's up to you how to pay it back. Doesn't it make sense to get the cheapest rate possible and the greatest tax deduction possible? Find out how much money you can save right now for free at SaveWithConrad.com. You don't need perfect credit, even scores in the 500s can be approved, and it's no cost out of pocket. But maybe best of all, we're licensed in more than 40 states. We can help more families than ever before. But how much can we save you? Find out right now for free with a quick quote from SaveWithConrad.com. Conrad Thompson, and you're listening to Grilling JR with the voice of wrestling, Mr. Jim Ross. JR, how are you, man? I'm good, buddy. Happy New Year. Happy New Year. Uh, I want to thank all the folks for the birthday group w- uh, wishes on January 3rd. That was nice. It's always nice to hear uh, nice things. And uh, it's, been, it's been fun, man. I had, you know, I, I as our schedule, our, our holiday taping schedule is a little bit fluid. And uh, is that a good word, fluid? It's, it changes from time to time because your schedule and mine, uh, you know, I've, I've had a lot of, uh, since we talked last, I've seen Oklahoma get their ass whipped by LSU, like government mules who got whipped. Uh, standing on the sideline for that was a unique experience, but I wouldn't have traded it and I still know you fans, so what the hell. Then I went to Jacksonville, saw the Jags come back and win a game in the fourth quarter against the Colts. That was fun. And Mr. Khan's family suite. For the food was Conrad, it was a guy like people like you and me that like food that really like food it was a uh, it was almost euphoric god almighty listen to this i had for the first time in my life you may have had this because you're a high roller big time car guy you know all this other shit fair son-in-law well, everything you're everything i had lobster pot pie oh it's great it's good stuff you have, have you ever had that? I have. I had it in Vegas years ago. There's one restaurant out there and I forget. I think it might be an MGM grand. And all I heard over and over and over was you got to go there and have lobster pot pot, which would have never normally been on my radar. And then I had it. Yeah. Woo. It was on time. These are like little bitty, uh, uh, like they look like little Davy, a uh, little Debbie tens, like those little pecan pies back in the day. Sure. Uh, they were about that size, kind of a little appetizer thing. Golly. I mean, I. I could have died there. I, mean, I, I was, I had to get away from it because it was, I, I can understand what, what people that get hooked on crack and shit like that, how they get a prisoner to their, to their vice. My God, I could, it was just, it, it humbled me. So it was a fun deal. That was a great time. And, uh, uh, the cons were great hosts. And on Monday I did a bunch of media and uh, the Raphael Morphy had a great idea. There was a, there's the folks from Knoxville were there because Tennessee playing in the Gator bowl against Indiana. And so we did an interview with the, uh, on, at their request, Knoxville station that, uh, and encouraged fans to come from, that were in town for the game to come join us on Wednesday night, 20 buck ticket, you know, and the next day's next night's a game. So you gotta, you get another little something to do there on, in your Jacksonville trip. And I looked in the crowd, uh, on that Wednesday night, New Year's night, and hell, there were some Tennessee, uh, Tennessee orange is hard to miss. Yes, it is. You know, uh, whether you love them or you hate them, it's just hard to miss. And they certainly, uh, were, were present there. So we had a real good representation at Daly's place. Interesting venue to, were you there when we did that first event? I was, it was awesome. It, isn't it, isn't it probably the most unique wrestling venue you've ever seen? I would have to agree. Uh, amphitheater. It's an amphitheater folks. It's pretty cool. 
So, and the crowd gets a good shot, a good, good view. And it's a good, there's no bad vantage point. So it's, it was fun. So I've done that. And, and like I said, had another birthday, moved on from that deal. Now I'm firmly in the back nine of my dead gum life. So that's all good. So everything's fine. I, I, I just wish my team had not got humiliated, but here's the thing. Sometimes Conrad, we hate to admit this for our loving, beloved programs. You, your crimson tide, me, my sooners. Sometimes the other teams is simply better. Yeah. Or they played a better game on that day. And that's the, that was the case was double whammy. They played a great game on that day. Did uh, LSU and they're a better team than Oklahoma, quite frankly. So it was a good experience. Nice new years. The only thing I regret not doing, and I got to figure this out. I got to look at etiquette and the protocol on uh, superstitious for new years. I did not have black eyed peas and collard greens. Mm. I'm very distraught about that. I'm kind of concerned. Are you honest with you? So I got something I got to make up for that. I got to figure out how to do that. But, uh, I figured maybe late is better than never. Yeah. If you're unaware, that is an old school Southern tradition uh, on new year's day. And, uh, well, one of the traditions in professional wrestling is to talk about the best there is, the best there was, the best there ever will be. Bret Hart is the subject of our grill and JR today. And we're going to talk about something that happened. I can't believe it. 10 years ago, last week, uh, this past Saturday was the 10 year anniversary of something we thought we would never see essentially hell freezing over Bret Hart would return to the WWE. And, um, I guess we should give you the, the heads up here that on December 28th, we knew it was going to happen. It had been in the dirt sheets for weeks that, you know, Vince was talking to, to Brett and they announced him as the special guest host of the January 4th raw, the very first raw of, uh, 2010. And they make that announcement just a few days after Christmas, 2009, December 28th. So it's a big deal to have Brett back in the fold. I'm curious, sort of behind the scenes. How in touch were you with Brett from 1997 to 2010? Uh, very sporadic and not intentionally. Uh, he was not mad at me, nor was I mad at him, Conrad. It's just our, our, our trails took us in different directions. Uh, never lost respect for Brett. Uh, I know that in the beginning of that, uh, uh, uh Montreal screw job that many fans still covet and love to talk about. Uh, and we're going to talk about it a little bit, just in context of what we're, we're, where we're getting here. But I, I, uh, you know, I, I, I just, I, I've always had great respect for him and he, he and I never had a cross word, but I think because he knew that I was working so close to events that, that I had to be in on it. And, uh, you know, that, well, I'll say this for the old man. He protected me from being in on it. I was not in on it. And because he did not want me to lose the credibility that I'd worked so diligently and hard to build with the talent. Cause, uh, it would be perceived that I turned my back on the talents, uh, to do only Vince's bidding. And although that may be true at the end of the day for a lot of people, it's not always the way it is. And you can never not put your talent first period football players, wrestlers, actors, entertainers of any kind. That's the show. Treat them good and give them a good presentation and or, or good surroundings. And it's going to work out. So bottom line is I never had any issues with Brett. We didn't talk much. I'm trying to think we bumped into some, each other somewhere. Uh, it was a little awkward, but not only awkward because of what had transpired in our joint lives. For example, you know, Owen, uh, Owen's passing, uh, Brett in the Montreal business, 97, uh, the fact that he had a stroke, our lives had changed immensely. Now I can't remember where I was at that point in time. I was battling a facial paralysis. So I was somewhere in that same progress and same transition, but he was always, a, he and I were always decent to each other. No issues. I think the, I, I, when I was preparing the show and on, on the notes that you provided me and going back and researching my own stuff and just trying to remember. You know, I, I think this whole thing was a uh, Brett coming back was a mutual, uh, a, a mutual, uh, 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 a mutual thing done with Brett and Vince. I think uh, Vince wanted to make peace, uh, uh, to some degree, cause everybody's always going to say, well, it's always about the money. So he made peace by booking a pay-per-view match where they could sell a lot of pay-per-views and make more money. Well, let's also be understanding that 
if they made more money and Brett was in that match and Brett also made more money. So that's not a, that's not a lose lose. So I, I kind of think that was a, how that was. I think both guys had gotten to a point in their life to where, uh, making peace and, and, and renewing a mutual respect that they'd had for many, many years, uh, was a whole lot more valuable, uh, than, um, holding on to grudges and animosities. Let's uh, lay the groundwork here. Meltzer would say, according to a WWE source who would have full knowledge of the situation, Brent Hart, 52, signed a short-term talent contract with WWE this past week, covering a period of January 1st through April 10th or through WrestleMania, and about two weeks after the March 28th show in Glendale, Hart simply told us that he wasn't going to lie about anything and thus wasn't going to say anything about the story. It was said that Hart wanted to, uh, keep his signing quiet and the return to be a surprise, but that WWE couldn't help itself and went ahead and announced it publicly on the first draw after the ink was draw uh, after the ink was dry. Easy for me to say, uh, the storyline start was that Dennis Miller as guest host was having a conversation with Vince McMahon and McMahon asked Miller who he'd like to see as a future guest host. And Miller said, Brett, the hitman Hart. And McMahon, of course, said Brett hasn't been on raw since Brett screwed Brett and stormed off. <laughs> and, uh, Meltzer would say the deal has been talked about for several months, perhaps as far back as SummerSlam. And one source in WWE confirmed it to us months ago that they had expected Brett in for a program, not a one shot appearance that the negotiations were at a level that he thought there was a legitimate shot of it happening. And after the story was reported here, Brett never denied the story, but always tried to play it down. And, uh, I guess we should mention that back in 2002, so eight years prior to this, five years after the screw job, uh, Brett was spoken about refereeing a match at WrestleMania, but he turned it down. And then in 2006, McMahon told the writing team that Hart had agreed to do the program coming off of uh, survivor series and that he and Brett would be doing a street fight at WrestleMania. Mm-hmm. But of course, uh, Brett had a lot of challenges at the end of his career. We should mention that, uh, the errant kick from Bill Goldberg at Starcade 99 has provided such a severe concussion that that's essentially going to be the end of Bret Hart's in ring career. He would take a few more matches here, there, but those were probably ill-timed. Uh, it's a major concussion. He never fully returns. And ultimately he's fired by WCW at just the age of 43. I can't understand this. I can't understand this. And, and you helped me figure this out. Anybody that followed Brett's medical history and the, and the challenges that he had, uh, that many perceive was a result of that kick, that errant kick, the accidental kick, uh, that then maybe led to his bicycle accident where he got banged up again and and hit his head and so forth. I, I never, when, when all that, the talk was going on, when Vince had the idea to come up with a great angle that he could book. He would control. It wasn't, it wasn't suggested by the writing team, et cetera, et cetera. It was Vince's idea, like back in the old days where they tried and true commodities such as Bret Hart, how anyone could have realistically believed that there would be a match of any ilk is beyond me. Right. It's like asking, well, oh, it's just wrestling. It's, it's play fighting. So they'll be all right. Well. First of all, Vince is not a skill worker. He's very stiff and he's very awkward at times. I was, t- I've been told by his adversaries, uh, all I had to do is kiss his ass. He wasn't awkward then. He just stayed, stood there. Uh, so I, I didn't get any, he didn't beat me up on that one. Uh, but the, uh, seriously, the, uh, the, the, the idea of Brett having a match with Vince's skill set and Brett coming off a stroke, I found it to be incredible. Really? Did we really think that was going to happen? And well, it happened. They had a match. Did they really have a match? Is that what you'd call that? We'll talk about that in a few minutes, but come on. Yeah, I just thought the whole thing, here's what, it, here's what it proves, Conrad. It proves that Bret Hart had legions of fans whose roots of, of his, of his su- support ran deep and forever. And they were never going to stop respecting are wanting to see Brett do something positive uh, in the skill set that he made famous that he was so good at, but his body was not going to ever allow that to happen again. But for some reason, 
you know, we all fantasy booked and got all crazy and boy, this, this could really be big, but it could never be big. It was built to be at best average. And I don't think it achieved average. Let's talk a little bit about the, these big moments in Brett's career towards the end. You know, we touched on the screw job briefly survivor series, 97. He winds up going to WCW. Did you have any contact with Brett around that time? I ask because you're famous for when, when Austin was sort of upset, you would reach out to him, send him a handwritten note. And those little gestures really started to light the fire again. And there was a conversation between you two. And one thing leads to another. Did you have that type of relationship with Brett at all? Did you have any sort of correspondence after the screw job? I think I sent him a text or left him a voicemail or something to that effect. Uh, because look, it was the holidays. Uh, he, he was, you know, it was a traumatic moment as we all remember. And for him, it was real. It was very real. Uh, it wasn't a storyline, storyline, play angle, whatever wrestling deal. So it was about his life and it affected him, uh, in a, in a way that a lot of folks could not understand because they couldn't remove, uh, reality from fiction. So, uh, but I can tell you that I reached out to him one time, but he never got back to me. So I just figured that either he's still believing that I was a co-conspirator of his, uh, Montreal business, or he, he just doesn't want to talk to anybody at WWE whatsoever. I didn't know. I tried one time. I left a message and, uh, never heard back as I mentioned, and I didn't try back again for years. Did you follow up at all after his retirement or firing from WCW? Do you reach out then, or do you reach out after Owen passes away? Any of those little moments? Oh yeah. 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 I, I but uh, to say, to compare my relationship with Austin and Brett would be unfair Okay. because it, it wasn't that way. It was, we had a very professional relationship that I saw, I was looking at my pictures for the, our book, uh, under the black hat's going to come out in March. Thanks to Simon and Schuster's efforts and Paul Bryan and, and the cast of thousands seemingly, uh, we got a hell of, we wrote a hell of a book, Conrad. It's a, it's going to be a, I'm really, really proud of it. I, I, a woman sent me some feedback the other day. That was a friend of Jan's so she could get through one chapter because she cried so much. Cause I was talking about, you know, how I got the news and the uh, first time I saw Jan went back in the hospital after her accident. So, so forth and so on. So, uh, I, I just, uh, I, I, I just, he just was, uh, we were, I was in New York doing some work and I ran into him at a, at a, we were same place, same time. And it was like, oh, home week. He got in a wrestling stance. He, he put his thumbs in like the old amateur sh old shooters do and, and having a bit sparkle in his eye and a smile because here's the deal. He's, he started to feel better. He started to feel better about himself. He started to feel better about his new relationship. He started to feel his health was getting better. So he was, he, he's, he's getting back to his old mindset and I don't think he had to carry, he, he carried so much of the burden of that family. It seemingly to me, he was, he's the guy that, that was, they hooked the wagon to on those tragedies, like Owen's oh, passing and, and then the Montreal screw job and all those things, you know, he was the featured player and I think he got tired of being the, being that guy I would. So, but we never reached, I always reached back to talents as I, as best I can or could when they had, a, when they had a monumental issue in their, in their life, a birth, a death, whatever it may be, but and he wasn't ready to talk then. And then finally, uh, I think after he, the he started talking to Vince again about coming back, uh, then things loosened up a little bit. Yeah. We should mention that, um, the match he was offered to referee in 2002 was the world title match between triple H and Chris Jericho certainly would have been a, a weird dynamic there. Uh, I guess no real surprise that he turned that one down. We mentioned also too, in 2002, that's when he suffers the stroke. Uh, the stroke at first leaves him partially paralyzed. Eventually he, he makes, uh, I guess, medically what would be considered a remarkable recovery to the point that you know, he can lead a, a normal life. And Brett has said that when he was in the hospital, Vince McMahon called to give him a pep talk. And that's really the first time they spoke uh, in the three years since Owen's death. And he wrote about that call. He says one day coming back from, uh, exhausting, uh, rehab, I was slumped in bed, ready for a nap when my phone rang 
and I couldn't have been more flustered or hearing Vince's voice. He gave me some kind words of encouragement while I resisted the urge to slam the phone down. My voice <laughs> cracked as I struggled to tell him that I really wanted to clear the air with him. And that one of the most important things to me that I didn't want was my career to be erased. And we talked about resurrecting the, that anthology in my career that didn't happen because of survivor series and about the idea that maybe someday I'd be inducted into the hall of fame. When I finally set the phone down, I broke down into tears because I realized at that very moment, I just dropped one of the heaviest rocks I'd been carrying around. Did you have a conversation with, with Vince about this call? I mean, you're famous for saying these days, you don't have room for all that negativity in your carry on. And it feels mm -hmm. like this is sort of a breakthrough moment like that for Brent. Yeah. Big moment. Here's the thing. Here's how I, 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 I conversed on, on topics, sensitive topics of a personal and professional level with Vince as much as he chose to engage. Sometimes on some topics we would, uh, discuss for seemingly for hours. It wasn't for hours, but it seemed because sometimes on those, some of those Saturdays we worked at his house doing payroll and booking, it could be three or four hours. But when he was engaged in something that he was passionate about, he would talk about it. And he, he was willing to talk to me about the, the Brett thing. I think the, the, the bottom line of that was, as I recall, is the, here's the, the, the genesis of it was this. I just want to move on. I want to put this piece of history these moments behind me as best we, I can, and things need to be, uh, the circle needs to be full circle or the, the needs to be unbroken or whatever you want to say. But nonetheless, that's Vince's idea was to, I think he wanted to get off his conscience. I really do. And I don't know if that's been a guilt. I mean, uh, come on. He, he, he orchestrated the Montreal screw job. It was his idea. So, uh, that's not a secret. So I think at some point in time, you're just going to get tired of carrying all that around because the, the, uh, tentacles of the Montreal screw job touched a lot of people that I don't think Vince probably in his, his inner circle that were in on it, even thought of all they were worried about was the belt, the fucking belt showing up on WCW. That was the whole story. My God, we can't have that. Why? I wondered it. It didn't mean shit. So what? It's a prop. He's not the champion. You know, it's just, to me, it's just, I don't know. I, I get real frustrated thinking about it, talking about it because it's so it's silly, silly. It comes down to this kids communication, really simple, big thing in life, big thing in life. You ain't got a dot, 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 LOL, all this other horse shit. The next text message I get from one of my kids with LOL and all these goddamn little faces, those emojis, I'm going to, I'm going to break my phone, speak English if you're English. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, he, he, it was communication. The lack of communication caused the majority of the problems in the aftermath of these tragedies. We should mention that the communication essentially dies after he hangs the phone up and a few years later, believe it or not, according to the rumor and innuendo, WWE was going to release a DVD called screwed where they would talk about the Montreal screw job. And the rumors were that of course, they're not necessarily going to paint Brett in the most positive light on that DVD. And they had done this a few years prior with the ultimate warrior. Well, it was called the self-destruction of the ultimate warrior. Allegedly, Brent get, Brett gets wind of this, uh, this idea of this DVD and, uh, somehow the two sides come together and agree to do a DVD anthology set on his career. And Vince even gives him creative control over that. And there's even a picture released around this time of Brett and Vince shaking hands. It feels like a real watershed moment. If you're a Brett Hart fan, you never thought this would happen. Do you remember hearing about a potential DVD project that maybe wasn't all that positive in regards to Brett? Well, of course that was going to happen because that was going to sell those proceed to sell tapes or their units. Yeah. And it's like click, getting clicks now, you know, people go on their websites and put things. I, they put one sentence out of you and I, my conversation with you on this podcast. And that's what they use their headline, even though immediately following that one sensational sentence. We explain exactly what we mean. Right. 
Well, this was not good on this TV show. Okay. But it can be fixed. Well, I want to write that. JR says, this is not good, but you don't say the rest of it, do you? Because you're, you're a click monger, little bastards, click mongers. So, uh, yeah, I, here's the thing. Probably during the time that Brett was at the 120 Hamilton and Stanford at the TV facility, uh, he had a, somebody was there that were internally that would go get him what he did tapes or whatever, go bring things to him so he could look it over. And, 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 but he took, he, he spent hours and hours and hours at the TV studio, essentially alone, uh, picking out footage, market logging it, what he wanted to use. And then, then sit down with, with a actual production person to, you know, to, to gather it all up and then figure out how they're going to edit it together to make some, make some compelling television while he was there in those long hours, I used to go by there on my way home from work. From the, I was in, I was in a, over in, in 1241 East Main in the, in the Titan Tower, uh, and, uh, on the fourth floor there. And then I would go by, uh, the TV facility on Hamilton on my way home to Norwalk. So, uh, that's where we really reconnected Conrad. That's where we really reconnected because I felt it, felt it very symbolic. A, we were really communicating. Well, we had very similar philosophies in wrestling. Anytime you get a couple of wrestlers together, or even got Conrad and JR together on a car trip, we're going to rebook the territory folks. <laughs> that's just what we do. And that's what every wrestler and he, they, where they admit they don't admit they're lying. They, we always like to rebook the territory in our eyes and how it fits our situation best. So that's what we, we were. He was surrounded by his favorite work. He was surrounded by his, his life. And, the, and because he will tell you that coming to WWE was what made Brett, the Hitman Hart a global star. He had great work and he was a hell of a hand before he got there. But when he got on that stage, uh, he grew into this amazing performer and that, that the audience much like stone cold connected with, and they became, they had a love affair. So, and he was surrounded by that, those feelings. So I found him to be totally almost like a, he had like a religious experience for lack of a better illustration. So that was some really good days for me and Brett, uh, while he was editing that show and you need to ask little questions. And you remember this, you remember, remember the one we did that or whatever. And some of those things I wouldn't, I wasn't there, but there was some that I was there, uh, doing play by play. Like I did the play by play on the, his King of the ring win, the first ever King of the ring. Uh, just had to be right place, right time. That was right. That was the first pay-per-view after WrestleMania nine. So, uh, I, and I, I have so much respect for him. It's not even funny. Uh, I just wish the hell he didn't live so freaking far away, uh, up there in Calgary and, uh, here me down here in, uh, Norman. So, but he's a, he's, uh, this is a, this is a good, I'm glad we're doing this show because I, I find it a little cathartic for me too. Well, a lot of fans felt the same way to the point that when he goes in the hall of fame in 2006, it breaks the ratings record for the hall of fame shows on the USA network. Of course, a couple of years later, flare induction would break that one, but what a big night, something that a lot of folks didn't expect they would ever see. Uh, what do you remember about Brett's induction? There's been lots of rumor and innuendo that while he was back, he still didn't want to have anything to do with Shawn Michaels. Do you remember Brett's uh, hall of fame induction and maybe any things you guys had to sort of make a list for and check them twice. No, I don't think no list. I just think that, you know, there was common sense to tell you that until closure was reached between those two men, it probably wasn't the greatest idea to put them side by side, not because they're going to have a big fight and get color that would result in a push Conrad. We've got to have a fucking push on the show or ain't the show. So no, nobody's looking for a push. The, but the, why put them in an awkward position? Why put their families and their friends who might be with them at that moment in an awkward position? Just didn't make any sense. That's not how you do business. But was there a big concerted effort to? It, there was a, there was a, an awareness that we don't need to do that right now. That's what I would say. Not the fact that oh boy, hey they see each other. Oh, this is gonna be a fight. No bullshit. Sounds good. And, uh, it sounds good on, uh, online, but it ain't true. It was rumored that, uh, Brent was offered the spot at backlash. Oh, six, uh, 
that show may ring a bell to a lot of our listeners because it's famously where Vince and Shane McMahon teamed up to take on Shawn Michaels and God. Yeah. Uh, we'll talk about that another time. I'm sure. But do you remember it ever being discussed? Hey, what if it was with Brett? Boy, that would be different. Yeah. I heard the conversation that, yeah, of course it would have been, it'd been great. Are you kidding me? All those, all those, uh, all those, uh, combustible elements and the star power and the questions, oh, well, is this, a, is, is this going to, are these the three guys going to turn on Brett? Is Sean and we're going to make up and Sean and Brett could be the greatest team ever. Can the McMahon somehow, some way, as they have many times, pull this son of a bitch out? What, what chips, what markers do they call in? Who's going to be in their corner? Who's going to back them up? All those things. Great story. But there's just one problem. Brett can't wrestle a match anymore. Right. And he wasn't going to get in a ring and stand side by side with Shawn Michaels, who could still wrestle a match and try to, and also try to have a good matches with both a good inter, inter, interaction with both Vince and Shane. Are you kidding? It's just, it, it, it made no sense. And I, and I, and I would say that, and I did not get dirty looks. And I just leave the room because the writers, you know, when they saw that Vince was happy about something or wanted to do something, you know, they, uh, they'll break their ass, man, to make sure that happens, whether it's the right thing to do or the wrong thing to do. It's because you can't, you know, it's, it's just, it's just, it's crazy. It's a crazy scenario there in that regard. But, but really when you start, you break things down in a common sense approach, kids, come on, come on. The man had a stroke. He's got probably got CTE issues that we don't know, but he could have because of the concu- severe concussion. Well, let me tell you some issues you're not having at your house anymore. And it's about your dick hair. It's 2020. And you know what that means? My no, what? Your penis hair. Oh, my God, Conrad. Looks like David Crockett's hat. <laughs> Let's do something different this year. New year, new me, new balls. Men, listen up. Harry Bushes are so 2019. If you're going to pick any New Year's resolution this year, let it be to take care of your junk. Manscaped is making it easy with their grooming products. And uh, I got to tell you, this is one of my favorite sponsors because Manscaped, well, they're just the best when it comes to men's below the belt grooming. In fact, Manscaped offers precision engineered tools for your family jewels. And, uh, we've even had some of our friends have some, well, some scary incidences where they weren't properly prepared. They didn't have the new lawnmower 2.0. Maybe they they (laughs) nicked or snagged. You don't want to do that. Manscaped has redesigned the electric. Yeah. Here's a Conrad. You don't want to walk around with a little piece of toilet paper tacked to all your nuts. No, you do not. That's, that's not a good look. No, it is not. No, and and it might sting a bit when he <laughs> when he when he put the antiseptic on it. So you don't want to walk around with little pieces of toilet paper stuck to your balls. So you won't have that issue if you do business with Manscaped, as our dear friend Conrad is suggesting that he and I both use. Now we have not experienced. We both are their sponsors here, and we use our sponsors' products. So uh, we know what we're talking about in this piece of business. Absolutely. You got to check it out, man. The lawnmower 2.0, it's got skin safe technology. That's proprietary to them. It means that, you know, manscaping accidents are finally a thing of the past. No longer will you nick or snag yourself. And by the way, you need two trimmers, one for your face and one for down there. Don't be nasty. But if you really don't want to be nasty, we got to tell you about the crop preserver from manscaped. It's an anti-chafing ball deodorant and moisturizer. And you already put deodorant on your armpits. Why not put it down there too? Get 20% off plus free shipping when you use our promo code JR. How easy is that? The promo code is JR at manscaped.com. Start the new year off the right way by using the best tools for the job. Your balls will thank you. One more time, get 20% off and free shipping with the promo code JR at manscaped.com. That's 20% off with free shipping at manscaped.com and use that promo code JR. Let's talk about 2010. Finally here, the very first raw, this is a pretty monumental moment. And I I feel like I need to put it in context because we're not just talking about wrestling in the WWE in a vacuum. This is the first time TNA has moved their show to Monday night. And they're trying to reignite the famous Monday night wars of a generation prior. Mm -hmm. (laughs) TNA has now gotten Hulk Hogan, Ric Flair, Eric Bischoff, Scott Hall, Sean Waltman. Jeff Hardy, 
Val Venus, Shannon Moore, Orlando Jordan, the Nasty Boys, tons of guys who have had successful runs with the WWF and WCW. And they've started to get some, some media partners too. Of course, famously, one of those is Bubba the Love Sponge, which once upon a time was a really big deal. It's syndicated radio, great close personal friend to Hulk Hogan at the time. Things change. Uh, either way, it's a big deal when TNA tries to make this move. When you first hear that this is the plan, a TNA is going to Monday nights. Did you think this was a, a boneheaded idea or worth a shot? Oh, I'm glad they did it uh, because it would, you know, it would settle issues once and for all. You know that we're we're going to be the dominant brand on Monday night. Come hell or high water, we'd earn that right uh, through the 83 week debacles and ass whoopings. We were Oklahoma and they were LSU for 83 weeks. It wasn't fun. Uh, so I, 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 nobody at our place was, was, uh, worried. Concern might be a good word. I don't know. Hell, I don't know, but you know what I mean is we're aware. We knew we had to, we had competition. We had to get good. We had to produce a better t- product. All that stuff that pr- competition brings you folks is folks is good for wrestling. The best thing for Monday night raw right now, if you want to make raw better. Put another show against it. Uh, some viability. Now I'm talking about AEW now. I'm talking about some other group. But that you get better when you got competition. That's what makes games interesting. That's why they keep score, for God's sakes. It's, it really it's just makes sense. So uh, I it, it wasn't an intimidating thing. You know, look, individually there's a the, the talents you name, Conrad, is a tremendous addition, a tremendous roster, I should say. But I didn't ever believe that for some reason that they had the leadership and that one person in place where they had complete autonomy to do as he or she chose. Uh, and because of that, not having the, that person, the great product knowledge with one decision maker, uh, I didn't think they could ever be successful. I am curious. Do you think that Vince wanted to stamp out any potential, you know, big first night for TNA. So let's do the biggest, most unthinkable thing we can. Let's get Bret Hart back into the fold. Do you think that was some strategy about not just having him come back, but having him come back on this particular show? I don't think it was the only strategy for starting off the year of the bang for the obvious reasons. The first show of the year, make it big. You know, we did that in Jacksonville the other night with AEW. It was an awesome show, but there, there was a lot of motivation. The fans are motivated. The TV audience is motivated and, and, uh, you know, our talents are motivated because it was the first show of the year. It was new again. So, uh, I, I think that we were more excited about that, but to say, I'll be lying to the audience here and I don't do that shit. Yeah. It was, a, it was an issue. Of course, if we could have a great show on the, on the, on new year's night, loaded new year's night show, and it happened to be against the debut of TNA. Uh, then so be it, but, uh, then that, and, and they, look, they, they had a good night too that night. No question. Let's keep it moving. Let's do talk about that day. The creative we know is going to be Brett and Sean in here together, which is kind of weird. Um, on the other channel, Dave Penzer is going to introduce Hulk Hogan live on impact. Meanwhile, here on raw, Justin Roberts introduces Brett Hart. Brett comes out on stage. He's still got the long hair. He's still got the leather jacket. Now he's rocking the jean shorts and Jerry Lawler on commentary. says something like, you know, it's been more than a decade since anyone has seen Brett Hart, including me. And, um, he starts his promo by saying, well, I guess hell froze over. And he talks about how a lot of people want to know why he's here tonight and why now. And he said, he's had a lot of time to think about things. It's been 12 years and it's an amazing feeling to be here. He's tried to find ways to come back over the years, but Vince would always decline and say it wasn't possible. And he says, it's great to be back. And now he can finally talk to, uh, the WWE universe. And, uh, there's a big welcome back chant. And he says something like, it's nice to be back as we continue to sort of move through this. He's thanking the universe for, you know, sort of carrying his flag and saying, he yeah, and, been and gone. Conrad, none of this is written. It's just off the top of the off the top of the cuff, off the head. He's improv- improvising. He's talking from his heart. Some of the things he said was repetitive. 
Some of the things, if you're a wordsmith, you might not use, you might, but it was a real, honest, legitimate promo. And it showed you that he wanted to get this off his chest. He wanted to cleanse himself as best he could of any existing and ongoing animosity between Shawn Michaels and Bret Hart. Cause that was just that chip away that one negative that we, he could continue to do that and get things positive around him again. He was being very, very honest in that promo. And the other issue is that when Sean comes out, you got Sean being the same way. Sean was very honest about what he, what he said and, and, and he, he meant every word he said. So all of a sudden you get a, you get a promo that's not written by a writer who's looking for a Vince push. And these two guys go out and deliver classics. And those are the promos that you and I are talking about today, 10 years later, that other people are talking about as well. 10 years later, that's money. He puts over that. This is the same building where he, uh, won the very first King of the ring. And then he says he needs to get some things off his chest and he calls Shawn Michaels to the ring. Of course, this is not just off the cuff. This had to be discussed ahead of time. Talk to me a little bit about, well, yeah, look, I'll just tell you, we're, we're, you're mixing metaphors here. The dialogue was, was they knew the general direction because Bullet they points. both knew they wanted to make, make peace, right? But the structure of who called out who and the, how he produced the interview. Yeah, that was, but nobody knew exactly what was going to be said once Sean got to the ring or whatever. It's two different pieces of business there, but yeah, there was a, uh, a plan to, to, to stage it and to block it off from a production standpoint. Did, I guess my question is when we're seeing it in the ring that day, <clears throat> is that the first time Brett and Sean saw each other that day? Or did they get together backstage privately ahead of time? I think they were, they, uh, they saw each other backstage. Yeah. So I think they, I think they kind of broke the ice a little bit and, and I don't, I don't, I'm not, I don't think they went over their promo. Right. Uh, like some of these cats do now where they you are know, going over their match, uh, in, in endlessly, how, how two guys, two women, two anybody's can spend 20 or 30 minutes going over a five minute match is beyond me. It, just, it defies mathematics and logic, but nonetheless, I'm sure that that building was not a huge arena, Nutter center there in Dayton, Dayton, Ohio. Uh, and I'm sure that they saw each other during the day. I don't know how they could have not seen each other during the day, unless, uh, they decided to come late and, but no, but knowing on a live TV day, knowing what piece of business they were going to be talking about, cause you could, you could bet your sweet ass that both those guys knew long before they got to Ohio, what, what they were going to do on Monday night. They just didn't know what they were going to say or how they how it was going to go, but they knew basically what they were going to do in, in structure. Let's talk a little bit about, um, you know, w when you, you put together a segment like this. It's a big segment on the show. How, how hard and fast are you on commercial breaks? I know that there are, there are soft breaks and there's hard breaks and hard outs. And just from a production standpoint, is anybody going to be able to say, we got to get Brett to hurry up or do you, do you just have those commercials ready to go? And whenever the segment's over, the segment's over. Yes. The latter, you, you don't, you don't want to, uh, you don't want to manipulate or, uh, abuse the creative on, on a moment like that. This is a creative that you can't reproduce. It's, it can't replicate. It's real and it's real and it can't be done again. Just like it's going to be done tonight. Cause tonight's the first time that these two guys have been back in the ring together, looking eye to eye that close. I mean, there, Sean was a super kick away from kicking, being able to kick Brett in the head. So right. You know, it's, it was, it was close quarters. So that was the mystique and the mystery of it, uh, of that deal. But, uh, uh, I, they were, they, they, they kept a lot of that. They, nobody knew what they were going to say. Uh, they didn't go to the ring and go over the promo. So I'm trying to tell people it wasn't like when you walk through it or right, here's your, here's your script and you go back, you go back and you're reading it, uh, for a mic level. I don't remember being a script in this deal. Now, I might be wrong and naive as shit folks, but I never saw one. And I, and I sat at ringside there. I, I didn't see any, uh, I didn't see any rehearsals on this matter. So 
We talk- it was a u- unique deal, man. It's just a very unique day. It wasn't a typical pro wrestling promo, but people are going to judge that way because they don't know better. Talk to me a little bit about the rest of the crew. You know, we've talked about Brett and, and Sean and their issues and, and, and how that's going to be resolved sort of in the ring. Um, but what about everybody else, specifically a guy like triple H who was once upon a time, the quote unquote, little buddy of Shawn Michaels. And now of course, in 2010, things have changed quite a bit. Triple H is now behind the scenes in a big way for the company. Was anybody nervous or was it different? What was anything different about this TV day where Brett comes back or is it pretty much just business as usual? Uh, very much business as usual. And that's the way it should have been. I think everybody wanted it to be that way. Uh, but triple H's loyalties, as we can see evidence today are always going to lean toward Sean, right? They're legitimately good friends. Uh, it's not about being tag partners or the DX, all that shit. That's, that's, that's fiction. They're legitimately good friends. And in the wrestling business, as a dream would say, uh, there ain't, you can count. I got any Hodge told me when I got into business, so when you get out of the wrestling business, kid, if you can name five great friends on one hand, you'll be very fortunate, five great wrestling friends. And here I am 40 something years later. And I can say that's pretty damned accurate because the, the business, uh, breeds mistrust and conning and the work. And so it's easy to get caught up in that bullshit. So the ones that ride the storms out and, and the highways and the rough waters that don't do that and stand by your, and got your back, uh, they're few and far between. So Sean and Hunter had that kind of relationship, very close, like brothers. So, you know, where Sean, where, but Hunter also for, uh, would not, was not going to do anything to go against what Vince wanted to do as far as the business was concerned. And Vince had his heart set on getting this, this thing with Brett done. And so anybody that, that tried to screw with that concept or that, uh, that idea was going to be in for a bad, bad day. Crossing a boss in that, on that level, ain't smart. It's a, it's a hell of a moment here, uh, because when these guys are, are face to face in the ring, of course, Brett Hart and Shawn Michaels, uh, Brett wants to take the opportunity to quote, bury the hatchet and call a truce. And Sean's, uh, you know, before you come out here and get your closure, I've wanted to tell you this for 12 years, you deserved what happened 12 years ago in Montreal. You disrespected me and this business. And yes, I had a hand in what Vince McMahon did that night. And of course the fans turn on and they're chanting, you screwed Brett and Brett just says, I rest my case. And then they get down the rabbit hole a little bit that when he thinks of Bret Hart, he doesn't think of Montreal. He thinks of their match. At WrestleMania 12 and mm. how they redefined, uh, the business that night, at least in his opinion. And then he says, are you sure you're ready to do this? And, you know, Brett says, let's be honest. You weren't easy to get along with, but you had a great career and I did too. And this shouldn't define us. And I'm offering you my hand and friendship. Let's be all real, you. all real now, Conrad. All this shit you're reading right now is all real, unrehearsed, unwritten, from their heart, but they knew in their mind what they wanted to say because they had been wanting to say it for a long, long time. So it may have sounded like they had this, the, a promo memorized. I bet in the reality and the, and the rubber meets the road here, they've probably been saying that promo in their head for years. Well, of course, you know, the Brett and Sean tease, there's going to be some physicality. It looks like Sean's going to set up a super kick, but of course that doesn't happen. There's the big handshake, the big hug, and Sean looks to be whispering something into Brett's ear. And, uh, Brett looks a little less enthused with the hug, but still, and then afterwards, Sean leaves his music plays and he's out of here. And Brett says something like, uh, come on, Vinny, don't keep the people waiting and calls Vince McMahon to the ring. And what a start to the show later. We should mention that Justin Roberts does introduce Mr. McMahon. Obviously there's a. Uh, a lot here that people are expecting. And he says, I'm hoping that you simply say to me, I'm sorry. 
how much of this whole Brett McMahon promo do you think was discussed beforehand? Still just bullet Very little. points. Very yeah, little. Bullet points. Bullet points. It just was it was real organic. Everybody knew how they felt. Everybody knew what we we're talking about. Everybody knew where we we're going. So it, you didn't have to memorize lines to say what was on your mind. That's what fans can't understand because today's shit is so written and structured. Got a writer for this, got a writer for that. You know, I don't, I don't like my promo. I, well then why don't you create your own promo? You asshole. God damn it. You're making a shitload of money and you're, and you're bitching about your copy. Are you kidding me? Bless your little heart, write your own shit then. And, and, and if it's good, I promise you it will air. So, uh, that piece that Jericho did on, uh, January 1st, uh, was absolutely brilliant. And if people hadn't seen it, find it on YouTube or AEW, uh, AEW, AEW, wrestling.com or whatever it is and look at it and see how a promo's done on one take with no script. Ideas, yes. Direction, bullet points, yes. Cue cards, prompter, rehearsal, no. And that's the beauty of the pro wrestling business over the years. Many of us will tell you, us old school bastards that are great, that are fans, have been fans of our life, and I will be a fan until the day I die. Unabashedly. AllEliteWrestling.com is where you'll want to check that out. Yeah, there you go. Thanks, Connie. So let's get back to when, when Brett and, and McMahon are here together in the ring. Um, Vince is saying, you know, I know these people, you know, want to come see you put the sharpshooter on me, but here's the deal. You screwed you and I'll never forgive you for spitting in my face, literally, or sucker punching me in the locker room or disrespecting me in the hall of fame. And you've trashed and slandered me in every publication and you know, this is the, the setup here. And it's the same thing Vince has said in public around the boys and uh, the, many of us on, uh, on multiple occasions, he did not write that. He, he just reacted to that. That's that was him. That's what he believed that he believed that. And he believed it so strongly that it became his this natural as well. It's all it's automatic. It's not, it was automatic, but we'll go ahead. It's a, it's an interesting story as it evolves here. Eventually, you know, Vince comes around and thanks Brett for all the thrilling moments he gave the WWE universe. And then said, lastly, he wanted to thank him for being the best there is the best there was and the best there ever will be. He extends his hand, Brett shakes it. And then Vince throws the mics out of the ring, raises Brett's arm. And Michael Cole is putting it over as a historic night that all these hatchets are finally buried saying something like, I never thought I'd see the day. And then as you can imagine, Vince kicks Brett in the gut, Brett collapses and the crowd starts booing and Vince is glaring at Brett and then walks out of the ring and Brett stands with his hands on his hips, glaring at McMahon who's on the stage, staring back at him as the show goes off the air. And after the cameras are off, the crowd gives Brett a big standing ovation, all the baby faces on the show. Uh, come to the ring along with the heart dynasty and, uh, they carry Brett on their shoulders and carry him around the ring. And he signs a bunch of autographs and it's a special night. And you wrote of this on your blog. My loyalty is still clearly with WWE, but I'm sure that Monday night proved to be an exciting one for more objective fans. And of course they're covering, you know, everything that happened online with the TNA show. It's Jeff Hardy returning to TNA. Rick Flair debuting for TNA, uh, Kurt Angle and AJ Styles having a singles match, but even, either way impact does a 1.5, which is a record for that promotion, but raw does a 3.6 quite the night for Monday night and the Bret Hart thing still very much a home run. Ultimately, you know, we get this thing kicked off with, with Brett and Vince, because we're going to build towards a WrestleMania match as we laid out at the top of the show. And, and there's going to be a lot of moments here along the way, including a February 15th raw where he makes a farewell from WWE. But as he leaves to go inside his limousine, another vehicle, uh, reverses into the door of the limo and injures his left leg. And then on the March 1st, raw Vince challenges Brett to a match at WrestleMania, Brett accepts 
and the match was later changed to a no holds barred match. And, uh, believe it or not, Brett and Vince McMahon had a match at WrestleMania 26. So you understand the angle of Brett getting his leg hurt in the limbo deal. It covered for him. Absolutely. It, it gave him self-respect and the quote unquote out. And it's not an out folks because of vanity. It's an out because of pride. And, uh, you, a lot of our fans, when we, when we put somebody on television, we just automatically expect it to be good. And as we all know, watch the TV wrestling, everything you see, is not good? It just isn't every bowl game that we've seen this, this until, you know, the million bowl games, they haven't all been good. So, uh, anyway, I, I just, it, it was, it's just one of those deals where, uh, the, the, the match was a fucking book, a bookie, a booker's, uh, paradise. How can you get better than that? But we had to protect Brett because we knew the match was going to be, it had to have gimmicks it had a shortcuts and to say it was a wrestling match, probably both men that were in it would probably disagree with our analogy or description of that. WrestleMania 26 goes down like this. Um, Meltzer would say, well, they did one thing, right? Brett beat him with the sharpshooter clean in the middle, but that's where it ends. It opened with Brett coming out in his jacket and jean shorts. And then Vince came out on the ramp and cut a promo saying this was WrestleMania and Brett deserves a WrestleMania size screwing. He says he spared no expense on a bunch of lumberjacks. And uh, one of which is going to be the special referee tonight. And, uh, he says the Brett screwed Brett and Vince screwed Brett. And now Brett's family was going to screw Brett and out come all the hearts, Bruce, <laughs> Diana, the heart dynasty, Natalia. And, uh, Bruce is working as a referee. And before the bell rings, Brett cuts a promo saying that he learned something about double crosses. So he talked to his family before the match. They told him what was up. And tonight, the Hart family was all united behind him and Vince was screwed again. And this is revealed before the match starts. And then Brett beats him up forever. And Meltzer says, I mean, forever. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. Lots of long. shenanigans here, you know, chair shots and the whatnot. And Meltzer would wrap it up by saying, I don't know the whole story, but apparently Vince designed, uh, designed this match with the idea that he would be, still be cheered at the end. Well, he wasn't and why he designed it this way is completely beyond me. So Brett killed him forever and finally put him in the sharpshooter for the win, a horrendous final match for the Hitman. And keep in mind, he was one of my all time favorite wrestlers, negative three stars, not the best rematch or the, the best match on WrestleMania 26. Maybe one of those ideas that look better on paper than an execution. Yo, without a doubt. Uh, and again, I said this earlier, how any of us could have really and honestly believed that a in ring performance is going to be up to Bret Hart standards or to the standards of the gravitas of this ma- of this match of this issue of this real legitimate rivalry, this personal issue and personal issues always outdraw the championship matches. Because we can all relate to getting screwed. We can always get, relate to somebody turning their back on us, lying to us, taking advantage of us in our real life. How many of us can, can relate to being a champion? Not, not enough. Right. The personal issues are where the money is in the pro wrestling business. It has always been that way. And I believe it will always be that way, especially when you water down the, the zillion titles and the. And he changed his drop a hat because somebody's bored with the champion or this guy's proceeding not to be drawing. Well, you got to give him a better push for God's sakes. So, uh, anyway, yeah, I, I, I think, uh, they got through it the best they could. I felt bad for them, but it was, it was not even a match. I'm trying to think in the old days when Leroy McGurk would put together a card then he'd write a story about it for the local paper. He had special attractions. So maybe this might've been a special attraction match, uh, but it was not a semi, it, it was positioned like a main event and I could get that, but it was a wrestling, wrestling match. It was a, I don't even know what, it, you can't say exhibition. I hated that one, but special attraction might be it. It's like saying Andre, the giant was a great pro wrestler. Andre, the giant was the greatest attraction 
in the history of pro wrestling. Andre cannot be considered the greatest pro wrestler of all time because he was not a pro wrestler in the sense that we judge those things. He was an attraction. And that's what these guys were on this night. They're because of age, skill set, and illness, injuries. The attraction was what we saw. And they did the best they could. But I, I, I felt badly that they were judged. That Meltzer gave them a ju- judged them on actually having a wrestling match. Yeah, I mean, and it's I, not like they could know, have expected Omega Okada here. I mean, that's not what the match was supposed to be. So, no, it was. So, but anyway, it, hey, it, like but you kind of nailed it. It looked better on paper than it did in the, in the actual execution. And, uh, but that is, boy, how, how many times have we discussed that in our lifetime? That's, that's a big, that's, that's been around forever, it seems like. We should also mention that, uh, this is a, an important moment for WWE fans, not just Brett, not just Vince. Cause I'm sure they want a closure, but WWE fans, they don't like to see their favorites at odds with the company and sort of, you know, whitewashed from history. They want those memories to be celebrated. And obviously things are much better today. Who do you think was, was more excited to finally have closure here, Brett, Sean or Vince? Oh, good question. Uh, I am going to guess Brett, Sean, and then Vince. Uh, I think Brett had been carrying around. You got to understand too. Brett was probably also carrying around the, uh, weight of Owen's death. In addition to his health issues, Brett's health issues, in addition to the Montreal screw job, in addition to a real negative experience in uh, WCW for Brett. So he had a lot of, he had, he, he was weighted down. So I think him unloading that wagon a little bit was probably would put him in number one in my book, Sean, Sean Michaels had become a born again, Christian, and it still lives his life that way today. And so it's not a fake deal. It's real. Uh, he's sincere with it. And so I think, uh, for his, for his religion, and thinking it's the right thing to do from a, a, you know, from a religious standpoint, then you got Vince. I think that's how I look at it. Brett, Sean, and then Vince would be my guess. Let's get to uh, Twitter. We took to Twitter and you can ask a question on any show. Uh, you've just got to follow us on Twitter. If you're not already go follow us right now at Jr. grilling, but we took to Twitter last week and said, on the next grilling, JR, JR and Conrad cover the triumphant return of the Hitman, the WWE in 2010. If you have a question for JR about Brett's return, leave them here. Hashtag ask JR. So look for a question like that coming up next week and every week. Just follow us on Twitter if you want to hear your question here on the show. Uh, interesting question here from John Hayes. He says, What does Jim think Bret Hart's career would have looked like had he stayed with WWE instead of going to WCW? So this is sort of fantasy booking the territories. You've said we like to do sometimes mm-hmm. let's pretend for a minute that the Montreal screw job doesn't happen. Vince figures out a way to, to keep the band together. Maybe there's some restructuring of a contract or what have you, but Brett is now on board for the ride through the attitude era. What do you think that would have looked like? It would have been very green because that's the color of money because it was reality based. Uh, storylines. Now, please folks, I swear to God, give me a break. Uh, yes, there were the Katie Vicks and some other ridiculous horse shit that we did. Absolutely. Some embarrassingly bad television, but with that said, there was also some incredible television that got ratings that were absolutely um, tremendous that haven't even been approached in recent years by any organization in that genre. Uh, but reality based is what drew the most money. Look, rock and Austin had three men events at WrestleMania. And none of those matches were cheesy, uh, corn pone, you know, uh, wrestling angles. They were, they're, they're personal issues. And because of the personal issues between those two uh, thoroughbreds were so strong. It made their, their quest to be the champion, even that much stronger, which gave the title credibility. So whoever held the title after rock and Austin 
got a pretty good deal. The belt was very shiny and it's positioned in a nice way. So I think Brett would have thrived in that attitude era, Conrad. I really do, man. His promos, he didn't bullshit in his promos. It was all believable. And look, anybody that saw WrestleMania 13 and saw uh, Austin and Brett have a match, uh, I'll kiss your ass in, in the post office on the third day of the month if you believe that uh, that was not a good match. I, I, you got to be kidding me. That was one of the greatest matches I ever witnessed in my entire life. And we could have got more of it in different ways. They could have become allies and they could have become adversaries. They could have been partners. There's a zillion things you could have done with the chemistry of those two guys. And you could have found some faction that wanted to limit them both to take over the company type deal. And so you could give them something to fight against. There's a ton of storylines that could have happened there, but he would have fit in like a hand and glove, baby. All right. Has a good question here. We've heard about this from Bruce before Pritchard. He writes, how difficult was it to do business with Bruce Hart during this and WrestleMania? He's had a reputation of sometimes being difficult because he always tries to find a way to put himself over and, or get another payday. Any good Bruce Hart stories you remember you can share with us? No, just in fact, he's a high strung guy, high strung, you know, a very, uh, intense. So, uh, I I've heard some of those same stories. I didn't experience any of them personally, but I know that he, uh, I'm trying to think there's a scene, uh, in the, uh, I think Austin told him this story in the mantra in the, uh, Calgary stampede, uh, event where Bruce hit Austin, in the kidneys. Yeah. Remember us talking about that? Sure. Yeah. There, so there's things like that, that kind of separating from the herd sometimes, because that was a, that was a tough shot. It wasn't a working punch. And anybody goes back and watches, uh, and Vince, you're welcome. We're promoting a lot of your WWE network stuff, but uh, and I'm happy to do it. I still subscribe since day one. Uh, go back and look at that. You'll see what I'm saying. Honoring, uh, honoring, yes, you know, a little, uh, he's had that heart aura. Of, I'm a tough guy. And whereas Owen and Brett were kind of reserved with their toughness. Uh, Bruce was kind of the other way, a little bit more extroverted. Bruce was a lot like, and I think that's why they're probably a real good team. Bruce was a lot like Brian Pillman he had a short fuse and, uh, and like to raise hell. So, you know, and, and you gotta have guys like that too, man, to make this crazy business work. Let's keep it going here and, and talk a little bit about uh ticket Drew's question. He says, did Brett show up alone or was he with a full entourage due to his paranoia regarding the return? Uh, I think, uh, I don't remember any paranoia makes a better story for you there, kid. Uh, uh, I don't remember any, the entourage, the big entourage that people relate to Brett was what you saw in Montreal, which is the exception, not the rule by, by far, uh, Brett didn't travel with an entourage. Now who, uh, who he oftentimes on the road, uh, he would travel with one of his sons. I don't, I didn't find that to be unusual. I thought it'd be, I found it kind of refreshing actually. So no, I don't remember any entourage with him. He came back. Everybody was ready to, to, to take care of this issue. I think everybody had the same agenda. Let's put this behind us and produce a hell of a wrestling TV show and let leads to something. And we did all those things, but unfortunately the something, the match specifically could never have delivered to the expectations of the audience. Yeah, I, I think that's right. Uh, one of the things I wanted to ask about this comes to us from Jay Ahola, and I think this is a great question. Uh, Pritchard has said that Brett wasn't available for the hall of fame presentation at all state arena on the WrestleMania 22 show. Famously, of course, the night before was the hall of fame. It's typical and common that everyone who goes in the hall of fame comes out on stage and waves the next day at WrestleMania. Brett is not available for that. And Howard Finkel even announces Brett, the Hitman Hart, was uncomfortable participating in this evening's event. What do you remember about that? Yeah, I, I thought, man, we've done a lot of good things here and Brett's in the hall of fame and, but what we've proven that the wounds have not healed, right? That this saga has yet to find its conclusion. And that for many of us that had great respect for Vince and for Brett, as did I, you just wanted to be over. 
for the love of God, how much can we talk about this matter? And how much can we keep dredging up this horse shit and, and packing our goddamn carry on with that negative. We talk about Conrad, God almighty, let's move on folks. So, uh, that's kind of where a lot of, a lot of people were on that thing. What about, uh, Lloyd's of London? Michael asked, did you ever hear about Brett potentially getting in trouble with Lloyd's of London, uh, from having this match with Vince? The idea being, I think he took a settlement saying that, you know, he, his career was injured, ended in the ring. And, and as of such, he gets a, a potential windfall there, but then he comes back later and wrestles Vince. Do you ever hear anything about that bubbling back up for him? No, I think it was, uh, it was addressed. But uh, there were stipulations in, the, in what he could or could not do in his insurance thing, as I recall, that were not violated in the contract. Because, again, if you watch the match again, you'll see they didn't do much. He threw punches and kicked. I, did Brady even go off his feet? I don't think so, because he just beat the shit out of Vince. I mean, I thought yeah, that was yeah. a workaround. Is if he's not taking any bumps, he should be good. Danny writes not- in. I was in the arena that night and everyone was buzzing about TNA and their first live show. How serious did the locker room take TNA going head to head that night? Less serious than where they're going to go eat dinner after the show. How's that? It's pretty legit. Yeah. They didn't care. We had lots of questions about this and I know you'll say, oh fuck. I don't know. But Chad Smith is one of the <laughs> many who said who made the call to change Brett's music. It wasn't the same iconic Hitman theme he had in the nineties. And I got to tell you, man, that is a little weird. Like whenever they bring Hulk Hogan back, they play the classic. Whenever they bring Steve Austin back, they play the classic, but here they're trying to use sort of the new heart dynasty theme instead. Yeah. I don't know the answer to that question. It it, it was, it was obviously run through Vince. Uh, they, there may have been a bigger picture, uh, reason for it to me, there would have had to been a, an amazing intellectual property, copyright, trademark some legal mumbo jumbo reason that came into play for me to even consider changing Bret Hart's interest music. But, uh, I don't know the backstory of all the particulars, but there was a reason for that. I just don't remember exactly what it was that I, I want to think it, may, it had to do with marketing and promotion and building a brand, but it had to do with, I think, uh, something about some legal issues. And I'm not sure how it all played out to be honest with you. Well, listen, I can't wait to see how we play out next week. We've got lots of fun shows lined up for you. We've got clash of the champions 22. That's actually JR's last clash. We've also got Royal rumble 2000 coming your way on the 23rd Royal rumble 2005 on the 30th and February 6th. It'll be all about clash of the champions 10. That's when sting famously gets kicked out of the horseman, but you probably weren't losing any sleep about that because well, you've been sleeping on a purple mattress. And purple is going to change your life. Do you spend the night tossing and turning? Maybe you've got some added neck pain or back pain because of the way you're sleeping. If you're waking up with a stiff neck, what you need is a purple mattress. If you have a better night's sleep, you're going to have a better you. That's sort of easy. And purple is the most scientific mattress around. Check this out. The founders are a couple of brothers who've been developing cushioning technology for 30 years and things like medical beds and wheelchairs. And then a few years ago, they put it to the test with the world's most scientific mattress to create purple. It probably feels different than anything you've ever experienced because this uses brand new material that was developed by an actual rocket scientist. It's not like memory foam. It's unique. It's both firm and soft at the same time. So it keeps everything supported while still feeling really comfortable. Plus it's breathable. So it sleeps cool. And right now you can even get a hundred night risk-free trial where if you're not fully satisfied, you can return your mattress for a full refund. They back this with a 10 year warranty. They even offer free shipping and returns. They'll even do a free in-home setup. And Oh, by the way, take out the old mattress. You're going to love purple. And right now our listeners can get a free purple pillow with the purchase of a mattress. That's in addition to the great free gifts they're offering site-wide. Just text JR to 84888. Now, the only way to get this free pillow is to text JR to 84888. That's JR to 84888. Message and data rates may apply, but Jim, you know it's legit and it's a great product if they're offering you a 100 night risk free trial. How do you beat it? 
That tells me everything I need to know about anybody's product. If they're going to give you their product, they're going to sell you their product, they're going to ship it to you, they're going to, you're going to get it installed, and they're going to do it for 100 nights. Because, it, hey, look, how, how long do you think it's going to take you to figure out that you're sleeping on the, on the greatest mattress ever made? How long is, do you think it's going to take you to figure out that you're getting the best sleep of your life? It sure as hell ain't going to be 100 nights. But that's what you got if you need them. A hundred nights free with purple mattress. And I see where purple's doing a lot of great television advertising as well. And the reason is they're, they have a hot product. They have a product that's hot. The public likes it. It works. And it's selling like crazy. Don't be left out. Fix your sleep issues with purple mattress. Conrad and I love them. And I promise you folks, you will too. Don't be mistaken. This is not one of those crazy memory foam jobs. This is technology that is unduplicated. Check it out. Text 84888JR. That's the word JR to 84888. Grab your free purple pillow. You're going to love your new mattress. Outstanding product. Can't recommend it enough. And I can't recommend that you check out our show next week enough. Your last Clash of the Champions. That's like the end of an era, Jim. Yeah, I'll probably cry through the whole show. <laughs> and, you know, but, <laughs> I'll, I'll, uh, but I'll, I'll make, yeah. It, I, hey, I took a lot of pride in those Clash of Champions. I, I, you know, I told this story, I'll talk about it more about the, the legacy of the Clash of Champions. You know, uh, Dusty, <clears throat> very competitive. And, uh, you know, putting Tony and I together in that first Clash is a big deal to me. That kind of launched my, my, my business on that free television, prime time, national cable. You know, and even though I was the number two guy on that broadcast, which didn't bother me a damn bit, uh, we, 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 we did it. We did a good job. And by the way, while we're talking about that oh, real quick, uh, on January 1st, uh, uh, Conrad, I don't know you watched, I thought Taz did a real nice job filling in for Tony, who was with the Georgia Bulldogs, uh, leading them to their victory over the Baylor bears and the orange bowl or the sugar bowl. Excuse me. Uh, I thought Taz did a nice job. It, it sounded like he had never left the booth. He did a great job. Hope everybody enjoyed him. Uh, if you haven't already go find our friend on Twitter. Uh, he is a fun follow. He's always got an opinion about wrestling and he did a great job on dynamite last week. And we're hoping that we do a great job for you next week with clash of the champions. 22. We'll cover cactus Jack and Johnny B bad and singles action, a singles match with two cold Scorpio and Scotty Flamingo, who we know is going to go on to be Raven. Chris Benoit is in there with Brad Armstrong. Vinny Vegas has an arm wrestling match. That's right. Kevin Nash diesel has an arm wrestling match with Tony Atlas. The wrecking crew rage and fury are going to take on Johnny Gunn and Tom Zink on a clash of the champions. And then for the tag titles, we've also got Shane Douglas and Ricky, the dragon steamboat taking on Brian Pillman and Steve Austin. A lot of talent in that one, Your Mm. your main event. It's all about the thunder cage. On one side, we've got Dustin Rhodes, Sting, and Cactus Jack. Across the ring from them, Big Van Vader, Barry Windham, and Paul Orndorff. An interesting time in WCW, January 13th, 1993. And that's coming your way next week here on the show, which will be January 16th. What an interesting time in WCW, to say the least. Yeah, man. It was, uh, for me, on a personal level, it was, I, I'd never been involved in, in more anything more interesting, compelling challenging, uh, for me, cause I had my issues with, uh, upper management there at TBS, you know, the cowboy bill Watts fallout, uh, that, uh, suck my ship. So, uh, yeah, it, it, good stories about that whole deal. And, you know, I, I had not thought about it. I left, I left Turner soon after that clash, not long, I mean, days. And so, uh, and I kept doing my radio show, which we'll talk about, but. And then we made the announcement of going to work for Vince, had Vince on the air, all that good stuff. So yeah, that was an interesting time in my life without, without a doubt. I love these stories. You know, Conrad, when you and I do these shows, like we're going to do in the UK, the, the Q and A's are, I can tell you from doing these shows the last several years, and you may agree or not, that the question, the level of questions are, are getting better and better every time we go out. Fans have more knowledge. The smart ones that are actually studying the game and not just bitching about things and being problem identifiers, you know, a, a goddamn uh, illiterate chimp can be a problem identifier, but they can't solve shit. Uh, but we have had, these questions are great. And, and we're going to be seeing the fans in London, Manchester, and Glasgow. And I'm told 
the tickets are going pretty good for uh, our friend, the Mystic Man of Europe, Kenny McIntosh. Yeah, I'm excited about that. But if you haven't already, check it out. It's inside the ropes. We're going to be there in February. We'll actually get the tour kicked off here in Alabama at Stand Up Live. It's Wednesday, February 5th, travel day on the 6th. And then come the 7th, we're in London and then Manchester and then Glasgow. Just look for Inside the Ropes and you'll be able to snag your tickets to see Jim Ross and myself. Just throw it in your Google machine. Oh, and don't forget, if you want to join us here in Huntsville, that's supershowlive.com. And we're calling it Super Show because Tony Schiavone will be with us. I guess there's no Georgia game that day. He likes to come to work, so that's nice. So Jim yeah, Ross, Tony Schiavone, and myself, check it out. If you haven't already, you should also check out Jim's new barbecue site. It's jrsbbq.com. It's inspired by Mama and enjoyed by you. All the great stuff, whether you're looking for sauces, maybe you're looking for some main event mustard or some ketchup, some seasoning, some beef jerky. It's right there. It's a family-owned business. There's no middleman anymore. You're getting it straight from the, the black hat himself. Go to jrsbbq.com and uh, they'll get it right out for you. Most of these orders are shipping within 24 hours, I hear. And also, the t-shirts are back up and running. Pro Wrestling Tees has caught up. JimRossShirts.com is where you want to go. My favorite shirt over there is Cake. It's inspired by the old uh, D-A-R-E, the old D.A.R.E. program. Well, this is C-A-K-E. You don't want to miss this. Go check it out. Jim Ross uh, hit the subscribe button to our show. If you haven't already and uh, leave us a five-star review, if you think we've earned it and tell a friend about your favorite new wrestling podcast every Thursday, only here on Westwood one grilling Jr. with the voice of wrestling, Jim Ross. Hey, hey, it's Conrad Thompson. Thanks for checking out the podcast here on YouTube. Be sure to hit the subscribe button and the notifications bell so you get a notice anytime we upload some new content. And go save yourself some money right now. If you're in a 30 year loan or you have credit card debt, it's not a matter of if I can save you money, it's a matter of how much. Find out right now for free at savewithconrad.com.